A Patriot's History of the United States, Chapter 11, Part 3. A much different industry developed on the plains where, from 1865 to 1885, the West witnessed the rise and fall of the cattle kingdom. Prior to the Civil War, when thousands of cattle populated the Texas plains with ranches stretching into Oregon and California, ranchers had shipped cattle to New Orleans, a special breed of cow, the Texas Longhorn, derisively referred to in the East as eight pounds of hamburger on 800 pounds of bone and horn, could thrive on range grasses without additional feeding, and those cattle proved especially resistant to ticks that carried Texas fever. Ironically, however, the resistance to the fever made the Longhorn a dangerous presence in the East where the ticks fell off and soon infected other non-resident breeds, leading to an almost uniform quarantining of Texas Longhorns prior to the mid-1860s. Then, by accident, drovers found that freezing temperatures killed the ticks. If a herd was held over on a northern range during a frost, it could be tick-free. Joseph G. McCoy, the founder of the town of Abilene, Kansas, was among the first to appreciate the benefits of both Abilene's cold weather and its location. He encouraged ranchers to send their herds to the Kansas Pacific Railroad's railhead in that town, which offered transportation to eastern markets. Jesse Chisholm, not to be confused with the cattle trailblazer John Chisholm, cut a trail from Texas to Abilene in 1867, the Chisholm Trail. With his cowboys driving some 35,000 head north in the first year alone. More than two million cattle came up the Chisholm Trail during the next 20 years. Cattle barons like Charles Goodnight and Oliver Loving established their own well-worn trails for getting herds to the railheads. Boomtowns sprang up to accommodate the cattle drovers as a railroad line extended westward. From 1865 to the 1880s, the cattle frontier was in its prime. Ranches such as the King Ranch and the XIT Ranch covered thousands of acres and tens of thousands of cattle arrived in Dodge City every year during its heyday. In the process, creating one of the most thoroughly American figures in history, the cowboy. There was something special about the American cowboy. Everything from his clothing to his entertainments to the dangers he faced seemed to represent both the best and worst of young America. Typical drives lasted weeks. During that time, upward of a dozen or more cowboys spent every day on horseback and every night on hard sod with only a saddle for a pillow. Meals came from the ever-present chuck wagon that accompanied the drives, and they usually consisted of beans, bacon, hardtack, potatoes, onions, and whatever game might be killed along the way without spooking the herd. The wagon master drove the chuck wagon, cooked, handled all sewing and repair chores for the cowboys, set up and broke down camp, and when necessary, was doctor or vet. Any cattle spotted along the way that had no visible brand were immediately roped, branded, and inventoried into the herd. Cattle required water at regular intervals, and the trail boss had to make sure he did not misread a map and cause an entire herd to die of thirst. Indians or white squatters frequently had control of strategic watering holes, for whose use which they extracted a hefty tribute from the desperate cowboys. Once they reached the railhead, the cattle went into stockyards to await trains to the Chicago slaughterhouses, while the dusty and thirsty cowboys took their pay and visited the bars and bordellos. That was what on the surface appeared to make the cattle town so violent. A combination of liquor, guns, and men nearly crazed from the boredom of the drive. Yet outside these railhead towns, and excluding a few of the episodes of gang-type violence, the numbers of capital crimes in the West appeared to be well below current violent crimes, so the Wild West was only moderately more violent than the rest of society. Historian Roger McGrath studied the Sierra Nevada mining towns of Aurora and Bodie, 
which had more potential for violence than other western towns. There he found that homicide rates were high, especially among the bad men who hung out in the saloons, although the homicide rate was about the same as in modern-day Washington, D.C. Yet he also discovered that virtually all other crime was non-existent, certainly due in part to the presence of an armed populace. Robberies in Aurora and Bodie were 7% of modern-day New York City's levels. Burglary was 1%, and rape was unheard of. Another study by Robert Dykstra of five cattle towns with a reputation for violence, Abilene, Ellsworth, Wichita, Dodge City, and Caldwell, discovered that the total cumulative number of homicides was less than two per year. Again, robbery, except for trains and stagecoaches, was largely unknown. Still another researcher examining Texas frontier towns from 1875 to 1900 found murder to be rare, not counting fair fights staged by gunslingers. Burglary and theft were so absent that people routinely did not lock their doors. Even in the California gold fields, with all its greed, researchers found little record of violence. For a brief time, it seemed as if the cattle frontier and the ubiquitous cowboy would never disappear. During the 1880s, the price of beef skyrocketed, and large European investment firms entered the market. In 1883, for example, Wyoming alone hosted 12 cattle firms with $12 million in asset. But because none of these cattlemen owned the land on which their cattle grazed, the public domain, Nudd had much interest in taking care of it. By 1885, there were far too many cattle over-harvesting the grass of the public lands of the Great Plains. Tragically, the weather turned at the same time the cattle were short of feed. In the winter of 1886-1887, temperatures plummeted to lows of minus 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Hundreds of thousands of cattle died of starvation, unable to graze the barren plains. The cowboy was usually the last in a line of characters to reach a town before civilization set in. Following the trappers, miners, soldiers, and missionaries, the cowboys inevitably gave way to the next wave of settlers, the farmers. The Homestead Act made available land in the form of 160-acre grants to 400,000 individuals and families from 1862 to 1890. Total improved acreage in the United States rose from 189 million to 414 million acres. And although the homestead grants were marked by fraud, the westward migration of legitimate farm families and the economic and environmental impact of that migration brought a staggering change to the demography and environment of the American West. In true frontier fashion, new Western farmers adapted to the semi-arid conditions that awaited most of them. New steel-bladed John Deere plows sliced through the prairie soil that had lain dormant for centuries, and barbed wire developed by John Warren Gates became a standard fencing material on the treeless plains. Windmills pumped groundwater, and pioneers learned Mormon techniques for dry land farming and irrigation. Corn, wheat, and oat crops were complemented by alfalfa for winter feed for cattle and sheep herds. Then later, fruit, vegetables, potatoes, and sugar beets emerged as important crops in California, the Great Basin of Utah, and on the Columbia Plain. Yet, frontier farmers found themselves pushed out by the emergent, high industrialized agribusiness sector. For example, the typical farm size of 160 acres, a figure determined by unrealistic politicians in the lush eastern United States, was woefully inadequate to support Plains agriculture. Drought, harsh winters, and competition from agribusiness combined to hurt small producers. Only capitalized firms could afford the equipment, steam-powered tractors, combines, harvesters, and irrigation technology that characterized successful farming west of the Mississippi. The small farm in America truly died more than a hundred years ago of its own inefficiency when two-thirds of all homesteaders failed. Even when farming proved profitable, 
life on the frontier beat down the sodbusters, who got their names from breaking ground with their plows, and their families with periods of mind-numbing boredom mixed with near-death situations. Wild animals, poisonous reptiles, deadly disease, drought, sub-zero cold, and blazing heat, all combined to make prairie living exceedingly hard. Sodbusters had to ward off clouds of locusts, track down stray horses, keep their wells safe, and watch out for strangers or Indians. The nearest neighbor might be miles away and the closest town often a day or two's ride. Generally, a prairie family would purchase supplies for a month and might not see other humans for weeks. No one in a farm family had much leisure time. Farm life involved backbreaking work from well before sunrise until after sunset. Farmers often ate five hearty meals a day. They rose before sunup, ate an early dawn breakfast, took a mid-morning break for another small meal, returned at lunch, had a late afternoon snack, and then ate a full-scale dinner after sundown. That meant that wives spent virtually their entire lives cooking, cleaning up from one meal, then starting another. And cleaning in a house made of sod, dirt, itself constituted a monumental task. Despite low pay, sodbusters tried to hang on because of the independence farm life offered and the opportunity they had to own land. Nevertheless, most went broke, and those fortunate farmers who eventually did acquire their property after paying off the mortgage still faced problems. Seldom did crop prices increase enough for them to expand operations. But there had to be something to the appeal of farming. From 1860 to 1910, the number of farms in America tripled. This dynamic placed some 50 million people in an agricultural setting, cultivating 500 million acres, an area as large as Western Europe. Such farm sector expansion was accelerated by something as small as a sharp piece of wire sticking out from a twisted wire at regular intervals, barbed wire. Joseph F. Glidden and Jacob Hash, two Illinois farmers, patented barbed wire in the mid-1870s, and by decades in, production had soared to more than 80 million pounds. Costing less than $2 per 100 pounds, the appearance of barbed wire carried profound significance for the plains, where little wood existed, and it benefited from the sales pitch of John Warren, better a million, Gates who trained a herd of docile steer and used them in his demonstrations. In fact, the wire worked as advertised. Wire did what innumerable judges, sheriffs, and even vigilantes could not. It secured the property rights of the small farmer against the cattle barons, and it took little to lay new wire if a farmer was fortunate enough to expand his holdings. In the short run, this forced the constant westward migration of the cattle drovers. In the long run, it probably secured the viability of large agricultural operations. Farming, milling, lumbering, mining, ranching, and harvesting of natural resources in the American West thus exhibited striking consistency. Small producers and entrepreneurs began the process only to be superseded by large capitalized firms that could afford the technology necessary to efficiently harvest fur, fish, timber, or cattle and foodstuffs. In so doing, they produced riches that benefited millions of Americans. The evidence shows that those who enjoyed government favors and subsidies abused the resources the most, whereas those who had to pay their own way proved the best conservators of our natural heritage. Ultimately, the story of harvesting of natural resources in the West is far from a tragic one. Rather, it is a story of transition and adjustment. The settlement and expansion of the Trans-Mississippi West exactly paralleled the rise of the Industrial Revolution and the subsequent decline of small producers and farmsteads in America toward the end of the 19th century and reflected a growth in manufacturing. Without question, some of the generation that migrated west following the Civil War paid a hard price for modernity. Most never found their dream of a Western Eden. 
Yet in the long run, a great many of them found a level of independence and prosperity unheard of in Europe. Those who did adjust and their children after them reaped the many benefits the Industrial Revolution and modernity brought in increasing standards of living and life expectancy. Only one group was largely left out of either the rising prosperity or the expanding political freedom in the West, the original inhabitants. And we'll go on with the Indians next to the last stand in the next session. Please like, subscribe, leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. See you next time. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.